Welcome to Usability and Human Factors, Human Factors in Healthcare. This is Lecture A. This lecture provides an introduction to the discipline of human factors with a particular focus on human factors concepts and principles. We will also characterize the ways in which human factors analysis makes use of concepts from applied cognitive psychology. We will particularly focus on the issue of selective and divided attention. The subsequent section of this unit focuses on patient safety issues and concepts, as well as an, as an introduction to the int analysis of human error. The focus is on understanding the nature of human error and appreciating a hu system-centered approach, which emphasizes the multiplicity and complexity of causes of human error. We then turn our attention to workload, which is an important construct pertaining to the potential for error in a work setting. In the final section of this unit, we will examine medical devices and discuss two human factor studies that examine efficacy of such devices in clinical and home health contexts. The objectives for this unit, Human Factors in Healthcare, Lecture A, R2, 1, distinguish between human factors and human computer interactions, HCI, as they apply to usability. Two, explain how cognitive, physical, and organization ergonomics can be applied to human factors engineering, and three, describe how the concepts of mental workload, selective attention, and information overload affect usability. Human factors is a discipline devoted to the study of technological systems and how people work with them or are affected by them. It is concerned with a full range of health-related technologies and systems used by a diverse range of people, including clinicians, hospital administrators, health consumers, and patients. In this lecture, we will frequently talk about both human factors and human-computer interaction, or HCI. They are different disciplines with different histories and separate professional and academic societies. HCI is more focused on computing and cutting-edge tech design and technology. Human Factors, HF, focuses on a range of systems that covers a wide range of hospital and other technologies. Patient safety is one of the central issues in human factors research. However, the two domains employ many of the same methods of evaluation and both strongly emphasize a user-centered approach to design and a system-centered approach to the study of technology use. Researchers and professionals in both domains draw on the same set of theories, including cognitive engineering. This slide covers the history of human factors, from the earliest efforts of engineers to increase the productivity of factory workers by changing environmental conditions. The discipline became formalized towards the end of World War II, and shortly thereafter began an age of great expansion. This Time corresponded to the beginning of the space age and the rapid growth of the automobile industry as well as aviation. The last 20 to 30 years have witnessed a considerable growth of the discipline in scope and importance. Healthcare has also become a focal point of work in human factors. Human factors have grown in importance and in public awareness in recent decades. Some of this is due to an increase in the use of technology by a diverse population of users, most of whom are not experts, a growing awareness of safety, and the cost of error. In industry, there is an increasing recognition of the need for better quality control and the fact that it conveys a competitive edge. The car industry is a case in point. There is a general perception that Japanese and European cars are of greater quality, and this has hurt the sales of North American cars. What is the central focus of HF work? Broadly, it is people and their interaction with the gamut of technologies and systems. This interaction can occur at different levels. The micro level is, according to Bub in 2012, is, quote, more engineering oriented, end quote, and, quote, gives rules for the technical design of workplaces and working means. In contrast, Bub defines macro ergonomics as providing, quote, rules for the creation of organization, company groups, and study groups, end quote. The goal of this work is to optimize these technologies su such that they match the capabilities and limitations of people who use them. As we will discuss, cognitive psychology plays a very important role in human factors analysis. These are just some examples of application areas in human factors. 
We will focus on computer systems and patient safety, but we will also touch on other areas of interest that exemplify important concepts and principles. Here's a picture of a control room in a nuclear power plant. Safety is a crucial issue in these settings. The television cartoon character Homer Simpson is probably not the embodiment of the ideal nuclear power safety inspector, although he is the best known. The picture illustrates the immense complexity of such an environment, and one can imagine the demands on human operators. There have been several significant accidents in such plants, and they have served as excellent case studies in human factors engineering. The aviation industry is one of the first to embrace the discipline of human factors, as well as human factors engineering principles. Although airplane crashes make the front pages of our newspapers when they happen, the airline industry has an excellent safety record in recent decades. Much work has been done on air, airplane cockpit displays, see work done by Christopher Wickens, and airlines have evolved a rather elaborate set of procedures for ensuring safe practices, which includes rigorous training of pilots and ensuring maintenance of pilots' competencies. We hear about the failures in aviation, but on, on, but on balance they set a high standard for matter, matters of safety. In the last decade or so, the healthcare sector has, to some extent, patterned itself after the aviation industry. For example, checklists, structured communication techniques, error reporting, and simulator training are some of the ways in which the healthcare sector has endeavored to adopt the safety practices and methods of the aviation industry. These are some examples of applications of human factors work in medicine. Infusion pumps are, in, are used to infuse fluid and medications into the patient's circulatory system. In recent years, there have been growing concerns about the safety of these devices. Over one million patients are injured annually by medica medication errors. Although most are relatively minor, some result in serious patient harm and even fatalities. The effects of fatigue, night shift work, and sleep deprivation on human performance and the safety of medical care are subjects of enormous interest within the medical community. Although this remains a controversial issue, several states have mandated that medical residents limit the number of consecutive hours in a given shift. Infection control continues to be a serious problem in hospitals. Simple interventions like the close scrutiny of hand-washing hand behavior of clinicians has had a significant impact on controlling infection rates in hospitals. All technology has unintended consequences ranging from positive to highly detrimental to patient safety. We will return to the issue of patient safety and discuss some of these examples after we review some of the core concepts and central issues in human factors. As we discussed previously, human factors is a profession that applies theory, principles, data, and methods to design in order to optimize human well-being and overall system performance. Unlike HCI, a system does not merely refer to a computing system. It may be a device, person, team, organization, or policy, to name a few. Ergonomics is broadly conceived as the study of work and factors that affect it. The term is sometimes used interchangeably with human factors. In any case, we can characterize three major domains, physical ergonomics, cognitive ergonomics, and organizational or macroergonomics. Let's look at each of these now. Physical ergonomics is concerned with physical activity and covers a wide range of related issues, including understanding and reducing injuries in the workplace, such as repetitive stress injury. In the healthcare domain, this could include reducing and preventing injury and designing workstations and workrooms for optimal human performance. An example would be designing medication labels so that they are readable and understandable. Organizational ergonomics is concerned with the study of socio-technical systems. The topics in this area include communication, teamwork, participatory design, and quality management. An example of an application to health is taking steps to reduce stress and employee burnout. Redesigning work schedules is one way to try and diminish the, work of, the risk of burnout. Recall that cogn cognition, as defined by the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, is, quote, conscious mental activities, the activities of thinking, understanding, learning, and remembering, end quote. So, cognitive ergonomics addresses the gamut of cognitive issues, including decision-making, skilled performance, and mental workload, 
which is an issue that we will come back to later in this lecture. It also addresses usability of systems, which is a central issue in this course. This lecture focuses pr predominantly on cognitive issues. Human factors can be construed as a discipline guided by principles of engineering and applied cognitive psychology. Human factors analysis applies knowledge about the strengths and limitations of humans to design interactive systems, equipment, and their environment. The objective is to ensure their effectiveness, safety, and ease of use. Mental models and issues of decision-making are central to human factors analysis. Any system will be easier and less burdensome to use to the extent that it is coextensive with users' mental models. We'll now focus on matters of attention, which is also a central concern in human factors analysis. Human factors focus on different dimensions of cognitive capacity, including memory, attention, and workload. Our perceptual system inundates us with more stimuli than the cognitive system can possibly process. Attention mechanisms enable us to selectively prioritize and attend to certain stimuli and attenuate other ones. Attentional resources are limited. They also have the proper property of being shareable, which enables us to multitask by dividing our attention between two activities. If we're driving on a highway, we can easily have a conversation with a passenger at the same time. However, as the skies get dark or the weather changes, or suddenly you find yourself driving through winding mountainous roads, you'll have to allocate more of your attentional resources to driving and less to the conversation. Most states have outlawed the use of handheld cell phones while driving because they serve to divide one's attentional resources and greatly increase the likelihood of accidents and highway fatalities. On the basis of studies thus far, it is not clear that using a hands-free cell phone has any effect on reducing driving accidents. It has the effect of sapping one's needed attentional resources. We have the ability to ignore extraneous information and focus on relevant information. However, humans can only process information at a finite rate, and performance typically declines as the number of sources of information increases. Information overload is a common cause of performance errors. This slide describes some of the conditions for overload. If you're under pressure to increase the pace of your performance, or if you're burdened by a heavy information load, the quality or accuracy of performance is likely to degrade. There is a speed accuracy trade-off. As you increase your speed of performance beyond a certain threshold, you increase the probability that the quality or accuracy of your work will degrade. Think of physicians and nurses in an emergency room. They may be working with several critical patients at the same time, which is a high-stress situation, often demanding rapid action. In addition, this is an environment with a high rate of interruptions. These factors could contribute to errors. This slide lists four factors that drive the selection of channels to attend to, and otherwise, in other words, to pay attention to. First, events or stimuli that are salient tend to capture our attention. For example, loud music or a conversation where someone mentions your name is likely to capture your attention. Second, we tend to sample the world where we expect to find information, and third, we attend to channels based on how valuable it is to look or costly to miss. This can be a property of expertise. Nuclear power plant operators or intensive care nurses are trained to attend to particular signals which are vitally important. Finally, if we're inundated with stimuli, such efforts may be fruitless. For example, trying to study complex subject materials in a noisy cafe may be very effortful, in other words, difficult. On the other hand, we may be able to read a newspaper or a novel in the same environment. Less effort is required. Time sharing refers to the ability to perform more than one cognitive task by attending to both at once or rapidly switching back and forth between them. We do that routinely divide our attention when working on our computer. We may be writing, listening to music, and watching out for an important email or text message. However, Given the fact that cognitive resources for attention are relatively limited, time sharing often results in a drop in performance for one or both tasks. 
We can modulate our attention resources by giving more attention to the task that is more important at the moment. On the basis of human factors research, we can draw the following design implications. If possible, reduce the number of channels that one needs to attend to. Make sources of information as distinct as possible. For example, an intensive care nurse may hear 12, 10 or 12 different kinds of alarms that signal various kinds of patient needs or concerns. However, the sounds are sufficiently distinct that he or she will know which ones warrant immediate attention and which ones can wait a little longer. Electronic health records can be designed or templates developed that correspond better to the desired clinician workflow and displays can be structured to provide easier access to needed information. Work scheduling can be used to reduce fatigue and improve performance. Although training is not a substitute for poor design, it can provide workers with strategies and resources to work more producti productively within the limitations of a given system. This concludes Lecture A of Unit 4, Human Factors in Healthcare. In summary, we considered the growing importance of human factors in health and other domains. Briefly considered pr different domains of human factors in ergonomics. Applied cognitive psychology provides some of the theoretical basis for understanding human performance in the context of human factors. The lecture also considered the issue of attention and the important role it plays in modulating performance in the workplace. In the next section, we consider the issue of patient safety and models of error.